Thank you. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف وجعلنا من أعباني وأنصاره اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الفهم وأكرمني بنور الفهم اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزان علومك برحمتك يا رحم الراحم الحمد لله we have توفيق to continue our study of introduction to kalam by late ayatullah mutahari رضوان الله تعالى عليه we said there are some doctrines of Shia Islam that when you study different schools of Kalam, they deserve a special attention. So we are not going to list all of our doctrines, but those things that in a study of different schools of Kalam are uh, uh, somehow controversial, somehow different among Madahib, we are discussing them so that we can understand where the Shia stand. Uh, we already talked about Tawheed and Adl, Alhamdulillah. The third doctrine is free will. So you remember that there were people who believed in Jabr, in determination, meaning that all our voluntary actions in the way that we call voluntary actions, indeed they are not voluntary actions. They are predestined. They are determined in advance. According to Jabriyun, it's not you who decides what to do, what to say, where to go. You were forced to come, for example, tonight. You feel you decided, but uh, you had no control over it, no you know, role. You just, at maximum, are the place and the subject in which Allah created this action. Okay, this is the idea of Jabriyun, idea of Ash'arat, about Kasp, Nazariyatul Kasp. On the other hand, we have people who have gone to the other side of the extreme, and they say Allah has a role in everything in the creation, but when it comes to human voluntary actions, Allah has uh, retired or withdrawn and delegated everything to human beings. So this is called tafwil, to delegate all the, delegate all the power and authority to human beings. He has no role here. So there are two sides of the extreme, Jabr, Tafid. Jabr, like Ash'arites and other people, Tafid, like Mu'tazilites. The idea of the Shia is that La Jabra wa La Tafid, Bal Amrun, Bayn al Amrain. We don't want to go to any extreme. We are in a middle position. We say, 
Allah has not delegated everything to us. He is still in charge of everything. But under his authority, under his power, under his lordship, there is a space for you that you can exercise your free will. Okay? You cannot change the whole world. <laughs> yeah? You cannot choose where to be born, when to be born, how to be born, you know. Uh, many things you have no control. Many things other people actually may do, or the laws of nature. But there is a space that you can use your free will. And what is amazing is that even if our space is maybe 1%, <laughs> yeah, in all your life, you, you don't have even control over 1%, yeah? Governments, politicians, business people, neighbors, you know, relatives. There are so many things already decided for you. So your space maybe is less than 1%. But what is amazing, your happiness is made only with this. All other factors, all together, cannot make you Saeed or Shaqi. They cannot make you happy or make you suffer. Only you. So when it comes to your destiny, when it comes to make yourself a moral person or immoral person, you have 100% control. Even shaitan, with all the experience and all the allies, and all the time, and perhaps some access that he has to our mind, and maybe some layers of our soul, cannot do anything except bring in some ideas and temptations. Even shaitan has no way to control you. So, this is amazing that if you just manage to look after your own decisions, you are guaranteed sa'ada, you are guaranteed felicity. Just look after your own decisions. Look after your own akhlaq. Seven, eight, ten billions, whatever people are going to come to this world, if they all go wrong, they cannot stop you being a good person. This is why Allah says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu alaykum anfusakum. La yadurrukum man dhalla idha tadaytum. O believers, be concerned and focused on yourselves. Those who have gone astray, they cannot harm you if you are guided. You do what you are supposed to do. Your personal duties and also your social duties. We don't say, you know, ignore people, we ignore society. But the main thing is all should come within one understanding of your own space. What you are supposed to go to, to do in this world. Sorry, it was me. Sorry. <laughs> My watch hit this, sorry, I'm very sorry. So, this is a very beautiful point. This is our idea about free will. There is a space for us that we can exercise. You may say, what if People have more difficult conditions. Some people have easier situations. Some people have more difficult situations. People are born to religious family, non-religious family, all, all different things. The answer is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would take all these differences also into consideration. 
he would not judge you just based on what you have done. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would say, what you were given and then what you did with that. Yeah? La yukallifu Allahu nafsan illa wus'aha. La yukallifu Allahu nafsan illa ma ataha. Allah would not ask you except what you have power and means to do. Yeah? So, those who have been given this much, they are going to answer how much they have done with this. Those who have been given this much, they are going to answer how much they have done with this. Allah would not say, no, you must be like that. He has done this much, you must also do the same. No, he is not comparing people with This is why I say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala compares each person with his or her own potentials. Okay? In other words, we don't need to put two people on the scale. <laughs> you know, in dunya, when you want to weigh something, we put one thing on one side of the scale, another on the other side, to see which one is more weighty. In dunya, this is like this. In akhirah, I think it's not like this. You can say it like this. Allah has for you a special scale. Okay? And this scale is your potentials. Then, whatever you have achieved, we put it in that scale, on that scale. Maybe you have reached 50% of it, so you weigh 50%. Maybe you have reached 20% of it, so you weigh 20%. Maybe someone has reached one percent, so would, so khafat mawazinu or thakulat mawazinu. Either your scale is very light or very heavy, but we don't compare you with something else, or we don't put you know a heavy stone and compare you with that. We compare you, or I mean Allah is doing this. Allah is going to compare us with what? With your own potential. So, those who are in more difficult situation, there is a good news for them. And that is, the little they do, they will get more scores. <laughs> yeah? So, you just do a little good, Allah would favorably consider that. Those who are in a better condition, okay, they enjoy e e more ease, but they have to do more. When, alhamdulillah, we have freedom, alhamdulillah, we have, you know, many facilities today. So we should answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How much we have done with this? Yeah, but those who don't have freedom, those who cannot even say we are Shia, we are Muslims. They will be put into prison, they will be killed. They can ho not hold classes, you know, there are some parts of the world. They cannot have any masjid, Husseiniya, anything. So, they are not going to be compared with us. The little they do is much better than lots of things that we do here. But if we don't do lots of things, we will be uh, in a lower situation. May Allah, inshallah, help all people of good will and all mu'mineen, inshallah, to use the best of what they have been given to function in the best way, inshallah. Okay, number four. By the way, if you are more interested about issue of justice, divine justice, Ayatollah Mutahari has a very, very good book, mashallah. One of his best books is Adil Ilahi. Divine Justice. This is a very good book, and because of its importance, uh, Alhamdulillah, we managed to teach the whole book in Jose, and there are, I think, 20 lectures on this book. The whole book is taught in English. It is a very good book. 
it can give you very good understanding of many issues. Number four, intrinsic goodness and badness. We have already several times mentioned this when we talked about Ash'arite, when we talked about Mu'tazilite, when we talked about the development of the science of Kalam. We already mentioned this, so you must be familiar already. The question is, are there objective, independent criteria for morality, for moral goodness and badness, or not? Is morality totally created or legislated or made by God and religion, or morality is there as part of creation, as part of the network of the truths. These are two different views. Some people say God decides what is morally good, what is morally bad. It means that if you have no religion, no faith, no morality. And secondly, it means that God can decide differently. Because there is no objective criteria. He says, tell the truth, you have to tell the truth. If supposedly he had said, you don't need to worry about the truth, then we would not worry about the truth. <laughs> but... The other idea is that no, goodness and badness are real, are objective. And even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala observes these realities. Allah, when He says, You must tell the truth, when Allah says, You must observe justice and benevolence and uh, being kind to your kinship. These are really good things, not that they are neutral and Allah just says, do this, and then they become good. <clears throat> Adl and Zulm are not the same, even if you have no faith. Many times we have discussed this even before in previous courses. And I always mention when it comes to this discussion, what Imam Hussein salam said on the day of Ashura. When he saw that some soldiers of Omar Asad and Yazid, they don't observe even the basic rules of war. Forget that the war altogether was unjust. Not legitimate. They should not have, you know, fought the son of Rasulullah without any crime. They should not have fought any person without crime, let alone son of Rasulullah. But forget that for the time being. Suppose we compromise about the whole war. But a basic rule in any war is that you only fight the soldiers of the enemy. Not that you attack children and women and innocent people. And when Imam Hussein alayhi salam saw that they are going towards the tents, he said, Illam yakun lakum deen wa kuntum la takhafun al ma'at If you don't have any faith if you don't have any fear of the hereafter, فَكُونُوا أَحْرَارًا فِي دُنْيَاكُمْ At least be noble in worldly life. Means with worldly standards. You say you are not a Muslim, okay. <laughs> Suppose you say we don't want to follow Quran, okay. Suppose we say, you know, we are atheists, we are, I don't know, we don't have any faith, okay. Is this what a noble person does in war? So, I think this is a good 
kind of evidence to say that you don't need to be religious so that you understand basic values. Yes, if you are a religious person, you understand it more clearly. You have more sanction, yeah? more power to encourage you to be uh, moral. Yeah? A, a religious person has to be more committed to morality. But this doesn't mean that if you don't have religion, then there is no morality at all. So, Shia have this idea that goodness and badness, and we mean moral goodness and badness, because there are three meanings for goodness and badness. We are not talking about that now. But moral goodness and badness, in the sense that something is praiseworthy or blameworthy, these are real, these are objective, these are things that even prior to adopting a faith, accepting a faith, you understand. And actually, this leads you towards faith. Because, for example, if someone says, I don't want to inquire, I don't want to study religion, how are you going to say, you must inquire? If you say, Quran or the Bible says that you must study, you must inquire, they say, I don't believe in the Quran or Bible. So how are you going to say you must inquire to see whether this is true or not? You have to use some moral command in them. That, for example, if God exists, suppose there is a chance that God may exist and has given you crea uh, your creation, your over every blessing, if Suppose God exists. Shouldn't you be grateful to God if he exists? Says yes. So, okay, so just go and see if he does, if exists or doesn't exist. If he exists, you must be thankful to him because he has done all this for you. So go and find out. If he doesn't exist, don't worry. If he exists, then you have to be grateful. This is what we call... وَجُوبُ شُكْرِ الْمُنْعِمْ وَاجِبٌ أَغْلًا From a rational perspective, you must be grateful to whoever has given you a blessing. So, if we don't bring, be, believe in moral values being independent, we cannot argue like this. If we say all the values, all the instructions come from religion, then this person says, I don't have such an idea that I have to be thankful. <laughs> you religious people say this. I as a human being don't, don't feel I have to be thankful. You don't accept. You say no. <coughs> Even if you have no faith as a human being, you are to be grateful. Even animals understand this. Yeah, At least some animals understand this. That you have to be thankful to someone who gives you food, someone who supports you. Many animals are tamed because of gratefulness, <laughs> because of loyalty. So if someone helps them with something, they show appreciation. So we believe in basic moral values being understandable by human reason and conscience. Morality also is independent, but religion comes helps us in different ways. Religion helps us with understanding details, with understanding priorities, with understanding complicated moral issues. Religion gives us more sanction. You know, many people, they feel they have moral responsibility. But when they also fear hereafter, when they have taqwa, then they know that they have to answer, their sense of moral responsibility becomes much stronger. Of course, a movement should reach the point through developing your moral awareness 
that if tomorrow there is no worry of fire, no worry of punishment, you would not change your behavior. But not many people come to this point. So, either for all your life, or at least for that p transition, religion helps you a lot. But if you become a virtuous person, then automatically, by nature, you just want to do good. Actually, good just flows for you, from you. Yeah? You don't need to pressurize yourself. But many people, unfortunately, at least to some extent, they need to be always under some instruction, under some you know, reminding power, so that they don't forget. <coughs> the next doctrine is about lutf and choosing the best or the most beneficial. One of the issues which was controversial between Ash'arite and Mu'tazilite was the, issue, the, uh, the rule of Lutf. Lutf, either in the sense of choosing the best, we call it Al-Aslah, the one which serves the best interest. Or Lutf in a more general way, in the sense that whatever can help people to go towards <coughs> obedience and keep away from disobedience is something that Allah has undertaken to provide. In any case, there was a debate whether we can say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala observes certain moral obligations, certain moral values, like he chooses the, the best, or we cannot say this. Ash'arites had the idea that we cannot say Allah has to observe any moral values. Because if we say he has, we are lowering na'uzu billah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and making him subordinate to akhlaq. Mu'tazilites had the idea that no. Allah certainly observes moral values, moral realities, moral facts, and this does not mean to make him subordinate. This is what then later the Shia Mutakallameen and philosophers have developed as something which would match with the essence of God. From that perfect essence, only virtues and virtuous acts and virtuous choices can come. Can you ever understand and explain if someone has no limit in power, no limit in knowledge, and is absolutely benevolent and kind, why he should not choose the best? <laughs> yeah? If there is no limit in power, no limit in knowledge, no limit in kindness and benevolence, absolute beauty, absolutely wise, why he should not do the best? Can you explain? There is no reason. You compromise because either you don't know, or you don't have means and power, or you are not very kind and benevolent. Yes? For example, I am a builder. You ask me to build a house for you. Why I should not make the best house that I can for you? Yeah? Why a builder would not make the best house that he can? Either because he has no time, or no techniques, or no materials, no helpers, or he wants to, you know, quickly finish something because he wants to make more money, he's greedy, 
or he is impatient, he's tired, you know, there must be a weakness here. Otherwise, someone like Allah who has no limit, no weakness, why he should not do the best? Even we cannot understand why he should do the second best. Maybe some of you say, but we have, you know, some issues in the world. This is what we have discussed in Divine Justice um, in a very detailed way. You have to look at the whole world as a system. Not just consider one thing. I don't know what's here or in another place uh, I mentioned. You make the best design for a house. Then someone says, I very much like the guest room. That was the best. Why you made washroom? You can always make the guest room. Why you make the washroom? You say, oh, your problem is you are not looking at it as a system. You say, because I can make guest room, I must make everything guest room. But then these people, where do they go? <laughs> If they need to go to the toilet. Do you understand? So if you just focus on one thing, you don't understand what is wisdom behind it. But look at the whole system. If you look at the whole system, then you would see perfection of this system as much as it needs the guest room, also needs washroom. Yes? So... The system is like this, that Allah has created a system, this system is the best system, and everything has its own function. The next doctrine is about the high regard for aql. Aql is considered by the Shia as a hujja. As Imam Qadim alayhi salam said to Hisham ibn Hakam, inna lillah ta'ala ala nasi hujjatan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has two hujja for people. Hujjatan zahira, we have external hujja. Ya al-anbiya wa rusul wa al-a'imma. Messengers, prophets, imams, these are external hujjah, means outside you. You go and ask them. You go and learn from them. But we have the hujjah and batina. We have also internal hujjah, we have aql. Aql, you consult it inside. The external hujjah you have to go and meet outside, but aql is inside. And there is no way to think there would be conflict between two hujja of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Can Allah send two prophets and they contradict each other? No. In the same way, it's impossible that Allah gives us one hujja inside, one hujja outside, and they contradict each other. It's impossible. Sometimes I use this example. I say, if I invite you to my home and send you an invitation by post and also I send my, for example, son and say, you also go and give them direction. So one direction on the letter, one direction sent in person. Can I put different directions? On the letter, I give one direction. In the person, I give another direction. If I do this, you would say, you didn't want me to come to your home. If you really wanted me to come there, why you are giving me different ad addresses? And <laughs> you are confusing me. And you know, I actually may remain at home because I couldn't go to two places. <laughs> I remain at home. It's impossible that Allah gives us one direction through aql, another totally different or conflicting direction through wahi, through revelation. It's impossible. This is why our ulama have this beautiful rule. 
We call it qa'idatul mulazama. Yeah? There is a correlation. Kullama. Kullama. Not some of the time. Not most of the time. Kullama. Always. Hakama bihil aql. Hakama bihil shara. Wakullama hakama. Whatever judgment is made by aql is made by religion. Whatever is made by religion is made by aql. Aql is sacred. Aql is hujjah. So we have such a high regard for aql and in our aqaid, in our akhlaq, even in our fiqh. We refer to aql because in fiqh is more difficult because a matter of law and law normally is based on the text. But you know, one of the sources of fiqh for Shia is aql. So we have discussed today four more doctrines of the Shia, and inshallah, we continue next session. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Thank you very much. Shay. You're welcome. Shall I will now break for Q and A. Uh, if there's any questions from the sister's side, please raise your hand. Alternatively, the brother's side. Any questions? Please feel free to raise your hand. We can start with either. Thank you. alaikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. In your discussion, you uh, commented that uh, an atheist may have to understand whether God exists or not, and if God does exist, then thank him for create, having created him. Yes. I was hoping you could help me articulate why creation is a blessing. It strikes me that having been created, we are now under extreme stress, tests. We, we suffer. We have to go through this world. We have to, uh, and this this testing is is a painful struggle for us. Mm. Not having been created, we would not have recognized any creation to have uh, been jealous of. And so, I was hoping you could help me explain sure. why creation then is a blessing. Very good on question. Us. Does he have anything that he loves? Or I can take anything from him. For sure, he has many things that he loves. So, who has given him this? So, so for, if, for every person, creation is a blessing, including those who yeah. are struggling so people, through people may vary, terrible times in war. People may in vary in the level of their appreciation of what they have, but there is no one that has nothing in life that he appreciates. At least he appreciates himself. At least he appreciates his family, appreciates his money, appreciates his education. <laughs> Therefore, there is always something that he can say, this is good. Okay, how this has come? We don't say it's from God. Go and inquire. Many of these people, they are very appreciative of themselves, of their life, of their families, of their friends, of their I don't know, money, car, house, country, city. They cannot say we don't have any blessing in our life. Thank you very much. Yeah. I think there was a sister's hand that was up. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I just had a quick question regarding um, the internal hujjat and the external hujjat. So if we have the internal hujjat, then why would we, for example, why do people have doubt? 
Because if the external hujjat is supposed to guide us, and then the internal hujjat is supposed to give us yakin, like for example, they guide us towards God or the fiqh ruling of the fact that, for example, there is one God and we, our internal hujjat allows us to believe it, then one, why is there doubt? And two, then what about atheists? Are they not given the same internal hujjat? And how, do, how is it so easily ignored? Mm. The answer is this ayah, لو كنا نسمع أو نعقل ما كنا في أصحاب السعير. Had we listened means listen to the external hujja. Or used our aql means listen to internal hujja. We were not in hell. لو كنا نسمع أو نعقل سمع to listen. You listen to the external hujja. This is called dalil sam'i, you know, what you hear. Aql is internal. So why they have ended up with going to hell? There was no guide? No, there was guide. But they didn't listen to the guide. And they didn't follow the guide. The, the guide which is external, they didn't listen. The guide which was internal, they ignored. So this is the problem. And it is interesting that even such people, if they had used their own aql, not aql of a mu'min, even their own aql was hujja. Because they don't say, if we have used aql of mu'minin, we were not here. If we had used our own aql, aql in every person is hujja, not aql of only some people. So every person who rationally Studies, inquires, collects evidence, either would come to the truth, or if for any reason doesn't come to truth, he is excused. Yeah? The worst is that he cannot come to the truth. Okay, if he has done rational things, he is excused at least. <laughs> Very good question. Thank you. Good question here. Good question here. Just to follow on from that, um, if everybody's using their aql, yes. and the aql is giving hujja, would you say people make wrong decisions because of their use of logic? For example, yeah. they may not follow the correct form of arguments. Yeah. So in the same way, when you listen to prophet, you have to make sure that you understand prophet properly. Yeah? You must know the way the prophet speaks. Also, when you listen to Agl, you must understand what Agl says. I cannot say because I have Agl, whatever I think or feel is judgment of Agl. You have to study logic. You have to understand what requirements are for a sound, rational judgment. Yeah? You cannot say, no, I feel like this. I think like this. I guess this, this is not decisive judgment of Agl. There must be decisive judgment of Agl that if you share with other rational people, they can see how you have come to this conclusion. This very important point. Uh, in some other places, when we talk about Agl, I have said this. Anything which is rational must be shareable. Please remember this. No one can say, I understood this with my Agl, but I cannot talk about it to you. I cannot explain it to you. <laughs> Anything which is understood by Agl must be shareable and must be available for other people's evaluation. Because Agl is common. This is the beauty of Agl. Even with your Agl, you can discuss with a non-Muslim, non-believer, a person from another part of the world, because Agl in all human beings works the same way. If we make different judgments, it is because of other reasons, not because of Agl. And this is why you see people get together in different platforms in the world. Doctors, philosophers, politicians, journalists, they get together United Nations people from 
I don't know, 160 or more countries, they get together, they discuss. Why? Because they believe that there is something in us that facilitates our communication. If we use it properly, you can understand each other and you can try to come to some agreement. This is the beauty of Aql. Thank you very much. Maybe we have time for one final question, if anybody wants to ask. Once again, thank you very much. Yeah, okay. Just a couple of announcements from me. As you must be knowing, next week is, inshallah, the last week of Hujjat Academy. I believe we have a double. This is the third Hujjah. <laughs> <laughs> We have two Hujjah Zahira Batin and Hujjah Academy. <laughs> to bring these two together, inshallah. So, inshallah, next week we have two sessions, yes. uh, Tuesday and Wednesday. And sadly, that will be the end of the semester, but inshallah, we do dua that we have another semester in the inshallah. new year after that. Um, and now we'll break for Tabaruk, uh, after which we'll rejoin again for the fifth class. Uh, apologies, today there's only one chai station on the ladies' side. I think the center's been quite busy today, and even just now there's another session going on. So my suggestion is that if the ladies can help themselves to chai first, there is a tabaruk set out on both sides, but for the chai specifically, maybe the ladies can go first, after they're done, the gents can then help themselves. Inshallah. So inshallah we'll break for about 10 minutes or so, but... Take their seats after yes, so once the ladies have took their chai, if you can please take your seats, then the gents can help themselves. Thank you. Ahsan. <laughs>